so now I don't have to fumble with all the audio stuff. All right, so um, it is recording already. Um, I will start with uh, the grade distribution of exam one. So what you see here is uh, two graphs. Um, the left one is the histogram to retrograde distribution. So you can see the majority or the mode is you know, people who get Bs, there are nine people. Um, and then you have, you know, basically that's the peak. Uh, the number of people who get A's in this graph is four. And then we've got nine getting B's, six getting C's, three getting D's, and one getting an F. Okay. The next one, the, the one to the right hand side, is basically if I sort all the scores in the graphs after the adjustment, um, this is basically what it looks like. So you can basically see that you know we have one, two, three, four. We have four people here, and then you know, and then it, it stays pretty flat. And then we have another dip here, and then it kind of gradually go down. Uh, so that's basically you know, that's basically another way to look at you know, the histogram. But this time you're looking at individual points or individual scores of the class. So this way, you know, in, you know, once you know your grade, which you should know by now, um, you can kind of see where you stand in the class. I do not assign grades based on, you know, relatively speaking, you know, who is ranked what, okay? So that is never really a consideration for me to you know, assign letter grades. Um, it's all based on you know, what score you're getting post-adjustment. So both of these are post-adjustment. I take the third highest score in the class turn it into one, the new 100%, and then you'll know, basically scale everybody the same way. All right, so that's one <clears throat> in the announcement. Uh, this is the second one in the announcement. I just wrote this module today about you know, what to do after the first exam. You know, this is basically the, uh, the module that I wrote this morning, uh, whether people should be concerned or not, you know, and also a quick recap of the things that are important in this class. Um, so that's one, that's a little, you know, this is kind of important. Um, and then I also posted, you know, something else. This is my tool, okay? I worked on this tool over the weekend, actually it's on Friday. It took me about two hours to make this tool. If you haven't tried it yet, you know, go ahead and click it. You, it will ask you for permission and stuff like that. You know, just give me permission because you're not actually this is not your spreadsheet anyway. You know, this is just my spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet has several tabs. You know, one tab keeps track of all the concepts. One tab keeps track of you know, how concepts can relate to each other. And then the last tab keeps track of the connections between the concepts. So you know, this one is all based on drop-down boxes, you know, based on the other two tabs. And once you're done with this, or you're halfway done, you can go to the first tab you know, that is you know, uh, labeled click and then go to this link here and click on it. And what will happen is it's going to plot you know, how the concepts relate to each other as a picture. So this picture is only based on binary addition. That's it, okay? You know, this does not contain binary subtraction. It does not talk about signed versus unsigned. It does not talk about comparison. It does not talk about double. It is just binary addition. So you can see that the concepts in this class is not simple, okay? They're all fairly complex concepts. So what do we do when we deal with complex concepts? So there's time management and then time allocation and also time you know, budgeting, that sort of thing. But the most important part is note taking because your mind, your short-term memory is very limited. When you're trying to remember things that are familiar to you already, like names or digits and stuff like that, you can store about seven to nine things in your head, okay, for about 20 seconds, <laughs> okay? It's called short-term memory for a reason. It is short-term. In 20 seconds, if you don't reinforce it, poof, it's gone, okay? So for complex concepts, okay, terms that you have not heard before, or concepts that are new to you, most people can only retain four or five, okay? I, and I'm average you know, with that too, okay? I can only remember about four to five concepts if they're new to me. 
So what do you do? You know when you can only remember four to five things for about twenty seconds, and the and the concepts are as complicated as this. What do you do? You take notes. Okay, note taking is really important when we are trying to understand complex concepts. Okay, so this is one way to visualize you know, how things relate to each other. Obviously, you don't have to do it this way. You can write it down. Okay, you can use Joplin. You can use a piece of paper and just a pencil. Okay, so you can use any tool you want. But whatever you do, do not rely on just listening to something or reading something and hope that you can remember everything and make relations or connections between the concepts. Okay, except for very few people with 160 plus IQ, it's not going to work for the rest of us. That okay? So I just want to emphasize you know, what we can do at this point. Okay, you know, particularly to people who may not be getting a grade that they are satisfied with. So I here I also kind of classify, you know, what do people want, need to do if they get an A already? What do people need to do if they get an a B, a C, a D, and an F? Obviously, there's no actually there there are no actual line between the grades. Okay, this is all kind of all one continuum, okay, it's a grayscale, okay, so these are only suggestions. Do we have any questions regarding the exam, okay, the grading of the first exam? If you have not noticed already, I have shared a folder with you. In it, you will find a scanned copy of your exam. It will contain a key, you know, with all the answers to the questions that are specific to your exam as well as a scoring sheet that tells you, you know, how many points you score for each part of the exam. Now, if you say, okay, I disagree with how you grade this one, let me know, okay? You know, because I have all the copies, I have everything that I need in order to reevaluate if you think that I have not graded, you know, fairly. So that's that, so, yep, go ahead. Where is that folder? That folder is shared with your WID at apps.losrios.edu. So if you go to your drive and you look for shared with me, and then look for, just look for your ID, okay? If you look for the ID, it should find it. Because, you know, there should be a copy of your exam, you know, with your student ID in it. There should be a key. I believe that one also has a student ID on it and also a comment, which is basically the scoring sheet. Can you find it? I'll let you, you know, kind of work on this a little bit. Um, all right. So moving forward, what we are going to do today is to talk about the tool chain when you need to write programs for the processor. So the very first thing we need to do, that I need to do, is to bring up the processor design itself, and then we'll start to do things with it. So today's lecture is really an extension to the lecture on last Wednesday. So that means, you know, it's going to, you know, I'm going to basically reuse some of the concepts without re-explaining those concepts. All right, so let's go to processor four. Okay, this is the processor. And we already know that the instructions are stored in RAM, which is this component over here. Last Wednesday, we only talked about how to execute the opcode called 00. It really doesn't do anything other than incrementing the program counter. But otherwise, it doesn't change any register or any, in, in any meaningful way. So what we'll do today is we're going to learn the tool chain you know, that can help you write code without you having to memorize everything because you know, we've got tools to help out in that process. So let's switch back to the browser. And at this time, we'll focus on a tool that is available to you already. It's called the assembler. But before we get to the assembler, the first thing we are going to get back to is, let me see here. Concept lab. Okay, I can just go to drive here. And then go to my drive, DIST 310. So I'm going back to the shared folder, which you already have access to. And then this time we'll go to the processor subfolder. 
And in that subfolder, there's an opcode table. So the opcode table is actually quite important. You <coughs> might want to consider going to file and then go to make a copy. With this one, you can also download because there's actually no script running on the side of the, on this side, on the server side. So you can actually just you know, download it as an Excel file and open it in Excel. The opcode table tells you everything that the processor can do, okay? And those things are separated into five columns. This is column A. So column A shows you the finally opcode of those instructions. So every instruction is represented by eight individual bits. So for instance, okay, I'll just make an example here. So for example, if you want to compare two registers, then you have to specify 0101 as the most significant four bits. And then the other four bits you know, will be used to specify which two registers are we comparing. Okay, well, I will explain you know, some of that later on as well. The second column, column B, is called the mnemonic. Because technically speaking, you can't write the entire program using just column A. But it's going to be a chore to have to remember all those binary opcodes. It's not like you cannot do it, but why do you want to do it if you don't have to do it? Okay? Because it is very tedious. But the processor, on the other hand, can only understand what is in column A. But you, on the other hand, you know, column B is not particularly, you know, self-documenting. For instance, okay, CPR is, uh, I take it back, it's not compared, this is copy register, okay? CP is copy and then R is register. So it is a very abbreviated version of, you know, the original operation. But column B is called a mnemonic, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C, mnemonic which is basically just an abbreviated version of what an instruction does. Column C is what I would call the RTL, or the Register Transfer Language. It is a way to describe ultimately what is going on with this processor. What does it accomplish? So column C is called the Register Transfer Language Description of what an instruction does. And then column D is really just more or less the full English description of what an instruction does. So there are all of these new columns. So for today's purpose, I'm going to use the add instruction. So I'm going to scroll down just a little bit here to show you what the add instruction looks like. It is on row 21. This is the binary opcode. In other words, if I want to say, you know, add a certain register to another register, I would use XXYY, you know, to, I would configure those to, into zeros and ones to specify which register I'm adding to which other register. This is the register transfer language description, which basically says whatever register Y is, is, is its content is basically added to whatever register X has. In other words, if you want to use the more abbreviated form of this, it is the same as X plus equal y, because we are using whatever y has to add to the existing value of x, okay? And, you know, this is the actual English description, not a whole lot going on here, and this is, you know, how you want to write it. So the next question is, what is x and what is y? x can be any one of the four registers in the register bank. Just a, as a quick quiz here. What are the names of those four registers inside the register bank? Yep, they're just A, B, C, and D, okay? That stuff is from last week, okay? Because last week we took a look into the register bank and we saw the names of those registers. So X and Y are both you know, any one of the four registers. Can they be the same? Can I add register A to itself? The answer is yes, okay? If you add register A to itself, you effectively double the value of <coughs> register A. So now, okay, we keep an eye on row 21. I kind of keep it selected. Then we go back and say, hmm, how do we specify the XX and the YY? The XX and YY, you know, to specify the four registers is if you want to use register A, 
then the two bits to specify is going to be 0, 0 in binary. B is 0, 1, C is 1, 0, and D is 1, 1 in binary, in base 2. And the same with Y, 1. So the, the two registers, you know, are all the, they're all specified. In column B, they are specified as A, B, C, D. But in column A, they're specified from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Are we okay with that concept? Are there any questions about how we utilize the opcode table to find out you know, how to make an opcode out of something that we want to do? So one zero zero and zero is that division yeah, instruction, that, and yes. then x y z one one two zero and one one. Correct. That, that so the one yeah sorry sorry that specifies a through d. So one zero zero zero, which is the most significant significant four bits, they have to be verbated of exactly like that. But then x x y y can vary depending on which two registers do you want to use, or sometimes it can be one because they can be the same register. So what there are fourteen ways to specify x x y y because each register can be can be paired with any other red four registers. So that's why you have four times four, which is sixteen ways to specify. You know, which register to add to which register. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Okay, so we will go ahead and specify a particular thing that we want to do, and then we'll try to translate everything. Um, I'm going to use mousepad just as a text editor. There we go. I'm just going to stash it over here. So let's just say that what we want to do is we want to add register D to register A. Okay, that's what we want to do. For whatever reason, okay, that's what we want to do. So the next thing we want to do is to specify in column C in RTL, which is register transfer language, we are basically saying A plus equal to D or A equals to A plus D. Is that okay? Does everybody understand how the English description of the line about is really saying the same thing as A equals to A plus D? Okay, so now that we have identified register A and register D, then we go like, hmm, which one is X and which one is Y? So you look at the format on line, on row 21, you go like, oh, okay, so the register that is going to store the result is X. So register X you know, the placeholder X is register A, the placeholder Y is register D. So that means XX, you know, in order to use two bits to specify register A, it's going to be hmm? zero, zero. Zero, zero. that's right. And then YY to, reg to specify register D is one, one. one, one, very good, okay. So that means the opcode the binary opcode is going to be 1000 zero, zero, zero in base 2, and then XX is 00, zero, YY is 11. One, one. So this is all in base 2. I just want to emphasize that we are looking at eight individual bits. Is that okay? So this particular process is called assembling, okay? You know, because what you're starting out with is a certain operation that you want to specify, and then we convert it into. Uh, RTL, which I think is a whole lot easier to understand than the mnemonic. But once you have the RTL, you know, there's an intermediate step here. You can also say in mnemonic, this is the same thing as add AD, okay, because it fits this particular format over here. And then in terms of opcode, it is 1000011, zero, 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 one, one, you know, because we went through the process of translating. So are we do okay relating the columns, you know, in the opcode table to how we applied the opcode table in actual operation. We go, we do okay with this? All right. So there are not really a whole lot of instructions in this simple processor. There are less than 30, okay, because I used a, a, a whole bunch of rows at the beginning, you know, for non-instructions. And then the last row is only 33. So I think we have about, what, 27, 26-ish, you know, actual instructions. But depending on the architecture that you're using, like most people who teach this class uses the x86 architecture, 
And that thing has easily more than 200 instructions. So that means, you know, if you have to remember the binary bit pattern for each one and try to figure out, you know, what the remaining zeros and ones you'll need to be, it's not going to be easy. Okay? So what we do is we have tools to help us in this process. It is called an assembler. So if you go to the same folder, which is the processor subfolder you know, of the shared folder, which you already have access to, if you go to the assembler, okay, it is also a Google Sheet. Now, this one only works as a Google Sheet. It does not work at all. If you try to download it and open it, open it in Excel, it will not work. It only works as a Google Sheets. So inside this Google Sheet, and when you go to the source tab, which is what I'm in right now, you know, people in the back may have a little difficulty you know, knowing that I'm on the source tab or the source sheet. Column A is the source code. So whenever you start a program, you can do it by deleting the entire column A, and then you start to write some code. So in this case, I'm just going to use exactly the same thing, add AD. And you can always put in comments too. I use the same standard as C++. So that means anything after the slash slash on the line is the beginning of the slash slash begins commenting on a particular line. So everything from here all the way to the end of the line is comment. It is ignored by the assembler. So in this case, I can just say, okay, A gets A plus B, or we are adding register D to register A. Whatever you want to do, okay? So up. After you press the enter key, it might take some time you know, for the assembler to do its work. Okay, so if you see you know in the other columns of it is loading and then dot dot dot, it is perfectly normal. Okay, just give it some time to get things done. The assemble tab, which is you know the fourth tab from the left, you know shows you exactly how things are done. So in this case, you know add ad column w is um, telling you the address of where this opcode is going into. So in this case, the only opcode we're specifying here is going to location 00, zero which turns out to be the very first location in RAM. That kind of makes sense. Column X is telling you what is the content exactly at the location that column W is indicating. So this means at location 00, zero we are going to have a content or value of 8.3 in hexadecimal. Um, column Y is not used in this case because column Y is only used when we have instructions that take up two bytes. So if you have an instruction that take up two bytes, then column X is going to be the byte at the location as indicated by column W, and column Y is specified the byte that is at one byte past the byte on in column X. Okay, so you take the address of column W, Add one to it, that becomes the address of the byte of column Y if column Y is not one. I can give you an example. So it is best to just give you an example. Now there are a, quite a few instructions. This one is not important, so don't ask me what it does. Okay, this is a jump instruction. It takes up two bytes. So in this case, uh, when you go to the assemble tab, you will see that it takes up two bytes. So 40 is the content at location 01, 22 is at location 02. Okay? I'm telling you this because in today's lab there will be a question asking you something related to how to interpret column W, column X, and column Y. So if this is something that will be useful later on, which also means if you think you may not remember, what do you do? You jot on some notes, okay? All right. So now, now that we have you know, all of this uh, stuff specified, the question is, but how do we get this program into uh, the RAM component in the processor? So let's take a look. So there are a few ways to do this. For, for a program this simple, one thing to do is to go to the location where you want the opcode to go and just type over it, like A3 in this case. You can do that, okay? It will work. But when your program gets longer and more complicated, this method may not be desirable because you, you can copy something wrong. And if you copy something wrong, there's no way the tool can actually check 
against what it is supposed to be, and then you have made a mistake. So if your program is getting bigger, it is best to use the second <coughs> approach. The second approach is to go back to the browser, okay, go back to the assembler, but this time you go to the RAM file tab. The RAM file tab looks kind of funky. The first line says it'll be 2.0 raw, and then the rest of it is just spelling out the spelling out the byte values one by one. So in this case, we have 83 being the add instruction, 4022 are the two bytes required by the JMPI instruction, which I'm not going to explain at this point. So the way you download the file is to make sure that you're in the RAM file tab to begin with. Then you go to file. Then you go to download, and you can choose between CSV versus PSV. Okay, that's up to you. I just use CSV for this purpose because I have PSV for other purposes, but that's up to you. So once you click that, it will. You know, my browser is set up to ask me you know, what name and where do I want to stash the file. I recommend you to do the same thing too because this way you have control over the name of the file as well as where you're putting it. So in this case, I'm just going to say this is add.csv <coughs> and then save it. It's already here because of last week. Okay, I've been using the same program since you know, last week. So I just say go ahead and replace it. Okay, so now it has saved it already. So now we switch back to the processor. And then what we do is we do a right click on the ROM, on, excuse me, on the RAM component. Do not do this to the ROM. Okay, you don't want to erase anything in the ROM. So do this to the RAM, go to load image, and then specify the path to the file that you just saved. So in this case, I put it into my temp folder. The name is add.csv. So yours obviously will be different. So you need to make sure that you reference the file that you just downloaded. Click open. And now you can see 834022. The entire program is now loaded into the RAM component. So it is a little bit cumbersome, okay, you know, because every single time you change a program, you're going to have to do this all over again. I will share with you some tools that can automate the entire process, okay, but at this point, it's not super important because we are really only focusing on one single instruction right now. All right, so now we are about to execute the instruction. And adding 00, zero because if I go into the register bank to take a look at register A and register D, they are 00, zero and also 00. zero. Adding 00, zero to 00, zero in order to get 00, zero is not very helpful nor exciting, and I cannot even tell whether the opcode is working or not, right? So we're going to change it a little bit, okay? So I'm going to pick some random values for A, okay, so let's call this your C6, okay, and then we'll make this one, eh, I don't know, let's try uh, 7D, okay. So I'm adding hexadecimal 7D to hexadecimal C6, okay. So before I run the code, one thing I want to do is to make sure that I know what the result is supposed to be, okay. So we'll go ahead and perform the addition by hand so that we know what the program is supposed to do to register A. So for that, I'm going back to mouse pad because I can just do this by hand. So now we are doing hexadecimal you know, addition. So we're adding C6 and 7D. So this part relates to um, the exam that I just graded, okay? Because you know, in the exam, we have a phase eight addition this is a base 16 addition. The rules are basically the same, okay? So there's no actual change of rule. So now the first question, oh, we have a default um, zero here as a carry. Okay, so now we want to say, okay, what is six plus D? Well, the first question is, what does D represent? If you have a table next to you of all the hexadecimal uh, conversion, D has a binary bit pattern of one, one, zero, one which is representing 13, okay, what we know as 13. 13 plus 6, so the question is, is it greater than or equal to 16, which is our base? What do you think? Okay, it is, so that means we have a carry of 1, so we stash a 1 over here. And what is 19, which is the sum of 16 and 13, 6 and 13, sorry, 6 and 13 has a sum of 19. What is 19 mod 16? 
is a three. So that goes here, and then three plus zero is just a three. All right, so now we have C plus seven. C is 12. 12 plus seven is going to be a 19. 19 mod 16 is also a three, but 19 is also greater than or equal to 16, so that means we have a carry of one. Three plus four is a, oh, excuse me, three plus one is a four. So we are expecting four three as the result in hexadecimal. We are expecting there's an overall carry of one. And since we're here already, we might, we might as well work out the other bits too. What about the overflow? Are we having an overflow here? Yes. I was just going to ask, how do you know? So we're just sort of, for instance, the, the point system is that it is combining the two elements, so it's just going to be two bits as opposed to, so how do you know the balance of the three, two, two, one? Or how do you know the balance of those Yes, how do you know the balance that are stored in those two? Because if I just stash these values, this, so six, so six, yeah, so six is the, is the register A, Right, but how do you know what's inside of those two? Because for, for what I'm seeing right here, and I, I try to explain it, we know what's it's already stored in C plus C, but I don't know what is stored in C plus C. I'm so I'm referring to this thing. No, C six is just a random value that I chose earlier to stash into register A, and then seven D is just some random value that I chose earlier. I know what your what your sum is right now. So that I can test whether the sum whether the add instruction is working correctly or not. Because adding zero, zero to zero, zero, ending up with zero, zero, is not very telling of whether the instruction actually works or not. Okay, because you can inject value into the registers manually, which is what, what I did. So what about the overflow, okay? So in terms of the overflow, what we need to do is to think about whether the sign makes sense or not. C has the most significance of being a one, seven has the most significance of being a zero, and four also has the most significant significant being a zero. So what this means is I'm adding a negative quantity and a positive non-negative quantity, getting a non-negative quantity. Is that possible? Yeah, it is possible in an addition. So that means your overflow is going to be a zero. We do not have an overflow situation. And then the L flag <coughs> is the overflow flag um, exclusive or with the most significant bit of the difference. Okay, so I'm just going to call this a D7. <coughs> so D7 is a zero. Overflow is going to be a zero. So the L flag is going to be a zero. <coughs> because that's how it is defined. All right. So I think we got most of the flags figured out. And the end result is not a zero. So the zero flag is going to be a zero as well. So I'm just doing all of these computations ahead of time so that when we execute the instruction, we can double check to see if the operation is doing what it's supposed to. All right, so now we switch back to the main circuit here. And this is where I am going to short circuit you know, the discussion a little bit because last week we talked about how to track down the execution of the instruction. When the microcode pointer is at zero, 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 and we are having a rising edge, it is called the fetch operation or the fetch phase of the instruction execution cycle. So control T, now we have just fetch. How do we know? Because 83 is now in the instruction register. We have successfully fetched the opcode into the instruction register. The falling edge doesn't do much except to increment the micro code pointer. So control T, you can see the micro code pointer is now up incremented to zero, zero, 001. The next rising edge is going to auto increment the program counter because we have just grabbed the instruction or the opcode from location zero, zero. I don't need the program counter to be continuing to point to location zero, zero because I have just grabbed the, that particular opcode into the instruction register. So the next rising edge is going to increment the program counter. Okay, so the program counter would increment to zero, one. So control T right there. And then the falling edge is actually important this time. Because last week, when we talked about the falling edge, it's going back to zero, 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 because you know, we are taking the instruction register content, um, and then we patch four zeros to 
to the right hand side, and that becomes the new value of the right field for corner. The last week, because you know, all the opcodes were zero, zero, so that means, oh, okay, the micro code pointer is just going to go back to zero, zero, zero. But this time it is different because the instruction register has a content of 83. The 83 are used to specify bit 4 to bit 11 that is eventually going into the micro code pointer. And then the least significant four bits or the least significant hexadecimal digit is a simple zero. So that means the micro code pointer will update to So you think about this, right? You know, the most significant uh, bit four to bit 11 are eight three. Okay, so bit four all the, uh, all the way up to bit 11 would be the same as the instruction register, which is one zero 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 one one. So bit zero to bit three are just four zeros, like so. So this particular bit pattern is going to be copied into the micro code pointer on the Atari Edge. So what is this particular bit pattern in hexadecimal? Because the register only displays its content in hexadecimal. Well, this is eight, this is three, this is zero. So we are expecting eight, three, zero to be in the micro code pointer. Is that okay? Now this is the last phase of executing an instruction that is universal to every instruction. This is called decoding, okay? We introduced that term already in last Wednesday's you know, discussion. So now we do a control T and there we go, okay? You can see how the micro code pointer is 830 and the content at location 830 in the ROM is now being dispersed to the rest of the processor. So now we have to go back and go like, okay, remind me again, you know, which, you know, components are going to be, do we need to analyze in this case? So there are only a few components that need to be analyzed. So we are going to go systematic, okay? So because the systematic way is to look at the register bank and see if anything in the register bank is going to update. This time we know something is going to update because input enable is a light green, it, it is a one. And whenever input enable is a one, it means one of the registers in the register bank is going to have his enable pin being a one, which means it's gonna update. To understand which one, we just have to go in. Okay, go to the register bank and we can see the register A is about to update on the next rising edge, okay? So the question now is, well, if register A is going to be updated, what is the source of that update? In other words, who is providing the value to update register A? So the value to update register A is coming in through this particular wire. So the question is, where is this coming from? It's coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer is enabled and it is selecting input one to become the output. So now we track down input one. Input one is coming from the ALU. This is the ALU. So now we have to ask, oh, what is the ALU is doing? Okay. So to understand what the ALU is doing in this case, the best way is to right click and go into it. Okay. So we right click on the ALU and we go into the ALU and then we say, okay, we know the output pin of the ALU being this thing here is going to update register A. But how do we come up with this bit pattern here? 01000011, how did we come up with this? So now we track this one back, it is coming out of a multiplexer. This multiplexer is enabled, and now we have to find out how is it, which input is it selecting to become the output? So we track down the select um, port, and that goes to op cell, which stands for operation selection. So this is zero, zero, zero. So that means input zero of the multiplexer that we were looking at is actually you know, feeding the output. So now we have to track this one down. So to track this one down, we go all the way and go like, oh, it's coming out of an adder, okay? So if it's coming out of an adder, we want to know what it is adding. 
the zero is being used as k zero. Okay, so when the, so we know k um, k zero is not contributing to the actual addition. So now we have to figure out uh, which two values are is it adding. This is the first value. This is the second value. So let's work on the first one first. So this value is coming out of a D multiplexer. The D multiplexer is enabled, and it is using the same select as the other one. So that means it is um, the input is connected to the output. Okay, no, that's okay. We'll track down where this is coming from next. Okay, but since we're already here, we might as well track down the second input to the adder. It's coming from the second D multiplexer. The select of the second D multiplexer also goes to the same OPSEL or operation select, which is also just zero, 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 which means this input is connected to output zero. Okay, so after all this, we now know that in one and in two are connected to the adder. Whatever the result of the adding is becomes the output, which ultimately connects to register A in order to update register A. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So now we ask, but who is connecting to in one and who's connecting to in two of the ALU? So we have to zoom back out, okay, because now we track down in one and in two, one at a time, okay, so we track down in one first. This is coming out of a D multiplexer. The D multiplexer is enabled. And then when you look at this wire over here, it has a value of one. So, or zero, 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 one in this case, doesn't really matter because the bottom line is the input is connected to output one, which then goes to in one of the ALU. So now we have to track this one down and ask what in the ALU is, is outputting to output zero of the register bank. I, I shouldn't say ALU, I should have said register bank. So now we right click and go into the register bank again, because we are now trying to track down this one. It is coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer is selecting input zero, zero, which is this zero here, which is connected to the output of register A. So now we know register A, or the output of register A is what goes to in one of the ALU which then goes to the first input of the adder. Okay? Now we go back you know, to the other input, which is this one here, and then we ask who is here contributing to this output? We look at the select of this multiplexer, it is one one, which is a three. So that means input three connects to the output. This is input three. It is connected to the Q port of register D. So this is how we know register A and register D are the two registers contributing the value to in one and in two of the ALU. The sum of those two is then looping back to the input of register A, so the register A gets the sum of register A and register D. Are we doing okay so far with all this? Yes, okay. Now, there's more stuff going on inside the ALU as well. Since we are talking about the ALU, might as well talk about that too. Because the ALU also specifies flags out, which is then used to update the flags register. As we can see, the flags register is also enabled at this point, which means you know, on the rising edge that is happening next, the flags register will also update. So the question now is, what? how is the flags register going to be updated and how does it get those values? So now we have to kind of track that one down. Okay, go all the way down here. And this is flags out, okay, which is the output that ultimately connects to update the flags register. So it has five bits, unlike the other registers, this one only has five bits. Bit zero is coming from C out. So we want to track that one down, C out. C out is over here. Um, actually, I take it back. Okay, right here. So C out is right here. C out is the output of a multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select that is also being routed to OPSEL up there, right here. So that means we are selecting input of that multiplexer to become the output. 
but the input zero of this multiplexer is just coming from a tunnel called C, and that in return is the carry out or K8 of the adder. The overall carry of the adder is now connected to C out, which is contributing to bit zero of the flex. What about bit one? Bit one is coming from Z out. So now we want to track out where Z out is. Z out is right here. It is the output of a NOR gate. The NOR gate is funny looking because it's taking all eight bits of the result of the addition. So basically we are doing a regular OR, okay, which means if at least there's one input of a one, the output of the OR is gonna be a one. But no, this is not a regular OR. This is a NOR because there's a little bubble here. So the one is negated into a zero. So Z out is a zero. And that is bit one of flags out. Okay, so if I go all the way back down, this is ultimately connected to bit one of flags out. And that's why we have a zero here. Bit two is coming from S out. Okay, so we want to figure out what is S out. Of all the bits, S out is perhaps the easiest one because S out or sign out is merely just bit seven of whatever the result is. In this case, because the result is 01000011, bit seven isolated is just a zero. And that's why S out, which is bit two of flex out, is just a zero. This is the zero that we saw earlier. The next one is overflow. So O out is coming out from here. O out is also coming out of a multiplexer. This multiplexer goes to the same OPSEL, and since we're selecting operation 0, 0, 0, so that means input 0 connects to the output. And input 0 is coming out of this network of gates, which is basically computing overflow in the context of an addition. If you add two non-negative values and you end up with a negative value, you have an overflow. If you add two negative values and you end up with a non-negative value, you have an overflow, okay? But in this case, we are adding a negative value to a non-negative value, ending up with a non-negative value. Yeah, there's no overflow, it can happen. So that's why, you know, you can see that overflow is also a zero. And then this one connects to the exclusive OR between S out which is the most significant bit or the sign bit of the result of the operation and overflow, okay? So that's basically our L flag. It is the exclusive or between those two. Zero exclusive or with zero is a zero and that's why we see bit four is a zero. So this is tying back to the discussion of binary comparison, okay? The concepts that we talked about in binary comparison, the overall borrow, okay, or carry, um, the overall um, sign, you know, those are all utilized here. This is not comparison, we are adding, but nonetheless, you can see you know, how the flags are coming, where they're coming out of, and how they get out of the ALU, and be remembered in the flags register that is sitting next to the ALU. Are we good so far? I'm just going to pause a little bit because I've been talking nonstop for what, 20 minutes at least. So to remember everything that I just said is gonna be a little difficult, but do you know how to track things down? The most important part is being able to, not to repeat the process, but to reason it out, okay? You know, what kind of reasoning did we apply to figure out how things are all connected, okay? So let's double check, okay? Because now we go back into the register bank and then we ask, how is register A going to be updated? The four three is in hexadecimal, the 67 is, is in base 10. So we ask, is four three what we got earlier from working on this manually? Okay, so let's go to mouse pad. And yep, four three is what we figured out earlier. Overflow is a zero, okay? The L flag is also a zero, the zero flag is also a zero, but the overall carry is supposed to be a one. So everything is as expected right now. We good so far? So the next step is just 
do a control T so that we have a rising edge. And then we can see how register A is going to update to 4.3 in hexadecimal. So here's a control T, and register A just got updated to a 4.3, okay, not unexpectedly. And then when we go to main, we can also take a look at the flag register, which was 0, 1, which is kind of what we expected, because only K, only the overall carry is a 1, all the other flags were zeros. So that's how we execute the add instruction. All right, so do we have any questions about this entire process? All right, so to echo what I said earlier today, how many concepts, how many things did I mention? Let's count, okay? Uh, there's the micro code pointer, the ROM, uh, register A, register D, the ALU as a whole, the two inputs into the, the ALU, the adder of the ALU, the output of the ALU, and a bunch of the you know, multiplexers and demultiplexers in between, okay? So the question is, can you remember everything that I just said? The answer is no, okay? Nobody can remember that. I cannot remember, okay? But the most important part is, do you know how to work on this step by step? If something is coming out of a multiplexer, do you know the next question to ask is to ask, hey, which input is being selected right now? Or even more importantly, if it is a multiplexer that has an enable pin, you have to first ask, is it even enabled? Because if the multiplexer is not enabled, don't even bother to ask the second question, which is how it is selected. Okay. So all of those are important questions. You know, knowing the process of how to figure this out is far more important than rote, you know, memorizing you know, the, the entire process that I went through today. And you probably want to do this to at least a few instructions just so that you, you get familiarized with the processor. Okay. Do we have any questions at this point? Is there a way to simulate multiple ticks? Like multiple ticks. Run through. Mm, well, only this particular tick is important. Only the execution is unique to an to an opcode, because the the fetch, the increment of the program counter, and the decode are common to the execution of every single instruction. So you can kind of fast track through those three which is a rising edge, a falling edge, and then the rising edge. But then the next falling edge is decode, and then the next rising edge, which is the, the fifth control T, is significant. So I would pause on the fifth you know, rising edge and try to figure out you know, how things are configured. All right. Yep. It is in um, it is in the uh, one of the announcements. In today's lab, it will actually tell you where to download it as well. But if you go back to the announcement from last week, I made um, a zip file so you can just download the zip file and unzip it. That's what we did on last Wednesday, I think, the ninth. Yep, that's last Wednesday. Did that already. If I didn't read my own announcement, I would have forgotten that I did that already too. <laughs> That's why I have to write all kinds of stuff because I cannot remember a single thing if I don't write things down. Yes? Uh, I'm getting unknown function errors in the assembler sheet. Unknown function copy and give it some time. Or refresh the screen. It, it might depend on which browser you're using to. You know, sometimes I get that too. You know, so it, it can be just a case of you know refreshing the screen because it's the same one as this one, right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I refresh it, you know, just give it a little bit of time. It should work out in the end. 
Is anyone getting an error also? Because I see at least uh, six people on it right now, including myself. Nobody is experiencing a problem. So it could be just yeah. a browser it issue. Works. It okay. works now. Okay. It might take some time, you know, because you know, all of these depend on custom functions you know, that I have written. Yeah. Okay. Can you explain the why and assemble uh, sheet on the new workshop? You mean the opcode sheet? No, the assembler on uh -huh. assemble page uh -huh. or, y row, or Y column. That's because the JMPI instruction takes two bytes. All right, any other questions? So how do you study this kind of stuff? Because I can guarantee you that your next exam or exam two is gonna be on this stuff. I will have questions to ask you, do you understand how an instruction you know, happens? So how do you study this stuff? Well, let me give you some idea. So all I can do is to give you some idea whether it's you know, what works best for you, that's kind of up to you. Um, hmm, I did not give you guys you know, the map here. Okay, so I'll give you the PDF. So PDF of the processor. Do you attach? And oops, I need to go to attach here. And it is in. Let's see. Processor. Okay, let's see what in what's in here. Yep, circuits.pdf. Here we go. All right, so I'm sending this to you because I think some of you may find it useful. Okay, so a section needs to be specified. I'm going to specify all sections here. Publish. There we go. Okay, so this PDF can potentially be helpful. Let's open it first and see what it is, okay, what it has. So press the enter key and let's open it. So this is the file, okay? You go like, but Jack, this is exactly the same thing as the processor itself, the ALU, and also the register bank. You would be correct, okay? That is exactly what it is. As a PDF, okay? As a single PDF that fits on one page on the printer, you can have all three sections. The way you do this is to print it out and then use pencil, pen, you know, highlighter and whatnot to help you track down things, okay? Because you know, if you were to try to track everything down like what I just did earlier in class, it's gonna be difficult for you because you're still new to this architecture. Which means if you download this, okay, let me just kind of zoom into one section here, okay? You can basically say, okay, we are supposed to start with the micro code pointer. So you check it, okay? You, you highlight it, you go like, okay, I just check this one. It's supposed to be draw and so on. And then you go to, when you get to the instruction to execute, then you systematically go to the things that we need to track down, which is the register bank, the RAM, the program counter, which is here, and to a certain extent, the instruction register and also the flags register. Those are the only five things that can potentially update. If you see any one of those things you know, getting updated, meaning the enable is running in Robinson, then you put a check mark on it and go like, okay, I need to track this thing. Where is it coming from? So now you have to track down you know, the multiplexers, the demultiplexers, you track down the entire path of who is supplying the value for this update. Is that okay? So having this you know, as a printout is just a way for you to kind of highlight and go like, okay, I checked this already, I checked this already, I'm on this one you know, at this point. Because if you don't do that, it is a, it can be a little difficult to keep track of everything that can potentially happen. Is that okay? All right, so this is just a tool, okay? For the next exam, you can also print this out you know, if you think it will help you in the exam, okay? It always helps, I mean, it cannot, it cannot possibly hurt in the exam to bring a diagram of the processor and its components, okay? So, you know, bring your own, okay? The nice thing about bringing your own is before you bring it, you can even color code everything. 
Azure for Bang is poly coded, the ALU is poly coded, the program calendar is poly coded, and so on. So that when you need to find those components, you don't have to look all over the place and go like, okay, where's PC? Okay, because I you, you have to agree, it's pretty hard to find PC, you know, if you don't know where it is. But if you already have it highlighted on your copy of this map here, yeah, it becomes pretty easy to locate things. Okay, so this is just a tool, okay? You know, you don't have to use it. I'm just giving it to you so that you can have it you know, at your disposal. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so you can also combine what we talked about today, you know, and that graph and all those concepts that we just talked about, and you can combine all, the, all of those and try to use the concept map you know, to help you identify how things go, okay? What is the first step? What is the second step? Who is updating what? What is selecting which multiplexer and demultiplexer and so on? So it's just a tool for you to document how things connect. Is that okay? Um, did I show the concept map? Did I show how to use it? I may not have shown how to use it, or did I? Maybe not. Okay, let's go. Let's do that. Okay, so the concept map is basically just a Google Sheet. It only works as a Google Sheet. Okay, so downloading this you know, into Excel is not going to work. It has got four tabs that you can see and one tab that is hidden that you cannot see. Okay, but that one is not important. The concepts tab is basically just nouns for the most part. You can also use equations. If you want to use equations, you have to start with two dollar sign and end with two dollar sign. In between, you can use LaTeX, okay, you know, which is uh, what you can learn by right clicking on my notes and just finding out how to type that step. It can be a phrase, okay, it can be just a verb, it can, can be a noun, okay. So these are the concepts. A transistor is a concept, a NAND gate is a concept, single digit sum is a concept, um, K of I plus one is a concept, and so on, okay. And then you can also define relations, okay. So the, the relations is up to you to decide how to define those things. Um, I think how something is defined is important, okay? So I definitely will def keep track of that one. Um, what concept depends on which other concept is also kind of important. Uh, it's a part of, can be important, and so on. So you can edit all of this stuff here, okay? So the concepts and the relations, your know, tabs, you can edit all of this stuff, you know, any way you want. When you go to connection, they're all drop-down boxes. In other words, if I want to add a new concept, I just need to do a drop down and select one of the things that are that are in the concepts tab, okay? And then I can select the other concept over here, and then I can choose how those two relate. Now, if you say, um, but I want to you know, specify a relation that is not yet in here. Well, that's okay, just type it here. Is that okay? So that means you know, if you want to create the family tree of the Simpsons, you can do that, okay? You can specify its father of, its mother of, its wife of, its husband of, and then you can make the Simpsons family tree, okay? Which can be a little entertaining. After everything is done, you go to the first tab, which is click, and then you just click on this you know, URL here, and it will show you everything in a graphical way. Is that okay? So it is just a tool, okay? You, know, you don't have to use it at all, but I think you know, it might be helpful to some people you know, to have a tool that can help you actually visualize the concept and how they relate to each other. Because you might find clusters of these concepts where they, there's a dense interconnection between those, and then, you know, and then there will be very sparse interconnections between clusters. So you know, that can be helpful, okay? And in the process of making this, you might be getting a better understanding of the material as well, because you go like, oh, okay, between these concepts, I vaguely remember they're related in somehow. Let me go look it up, okay? Because so it might actually you know, prompt you into reading the notes just to find out how two concepts are related, because you remember vaguely that they are related, but you cannot remember you cannot remember exactly how they're related. So you just look it up, put that relation in so that it shows up in the diagram. 
Is that okay? So it's just me you know, trying to find some way for you guys to do something in order to you know, understand how the concepts are related. Are we good so far or not? Okay. So in terms of reading, there is quite a bit of reading as well. Okay, you know, I'm trying to supplement as much as I can in terms of you know, writing things down. Okay. So TPP explained sort of is actually an explanation of these concepts. Um, this one is still you know, not in GitHub, but it's the same thing. Okay. So it basically talked about the ALU. It talked about you know, the three phases of executing instruction, fetch, decode, and execute. So basically, everything that we talked about last Wednesday is already here. Okay? If you have read this already, then none of the first part of today's lecture here is going to be exciting because it is already here. It's only the actual execution of the add instruction that is slightly entertaining because it's that one is specific to the add instruction. All right. Do we have any questions? Okay. So before I forget, I am going to go to the assembler and delete the entire program. Because today's lab requires you to paste your own program into the assembler. And some people last week in the Tuesday, Thursday class, um, they thought that the code that's already in here is what they're supposed to be using in the lab. That is not the case, okay? So your lab will come with certain instructions that you only have to copy and paste into here, and then you run the code. So let me show you how to run the code and how you can tell whether your program has concluded or not. So I'm going to write some program here, okay? I'm start with a no op instruction for no particular reason. And then I have LDI C with 20. <clears throat> um, and then I'll decrement C and CC. And then we'll do a J um, ZI to a one, ZMTI back to an earlier point. So I'm going to say dot, let's see, Ooh, this, this, can be, this can be a little tough here. One, two, three, four. Okay. Four minus. This is L one. See, if you type in some things that you're not supposed to, or there's a problem, it will tell you there's a problem. So the error checking logic is actually, it takes quite a bit of time to get that part done. So this is L1 with a colon, and then the halt instruction too. Okay. So your program is not the same as this one. Okay. So make sure that you copy and paste your own program. And before you do that, the first thing, the very first thing you need to do is to go to file and then go to make a copy, okay? Because you will need your own copy of the assembler in order to do your lab. All right, so I go to the RAM file, go to file, and then go to download CSV, and I'll just go, you know, name it as sample. And before I do that, before I do anything else, I go to the assemble tab just to make sure that the branch is correct. Okay, it is correct. Don't worry about this part. We'll talk about the jump instruction in about eh, maybe a week or two. Now let's switch back to the um, processor. So if you're redoing something, okay, if you change the program, you, you want to redo something, the best way to make sure everything starts fresh is to go to simulate and reset simulation. Yes. Uh, because you need to specify a folder that is actually on your drive and not on mine. Because by default, it will try to make a copy in the very same folder, which you only have read access to. So now I go to the RAM component, go to load image, and I have already forgotten the name of the file. I believe it is sample.csv. Let's hope. Yep. Okay. It is correct. Okay. So the, now the program is in. So in your lab, okay, uh, you can go ahead and increase the tick frequency all the way to the maximum of 4.1 kilohertz because otherwise it will take a while. So make sure that it's maximized. And then you go to simulate again and just go to tick enable, which is control K. 
So what this is doing is it will basically speed up the processing as much as you can possibly can. And the way you can tell whether your program has completed is to check the pulse count. The pulse pin, if this is an output pin, if the pulse output pin is a one, it means the program is done already. So any further ticking is not gonna do any difference, make any difference. So now we can go to simulate again, stop the simulation, so you can go to uncheck text, text enable, which is another control K. Then at that point, you can go ahead and examine things. So you can look at the PC, you can look at, the, the PC is now at zero A, you can look at the registers, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of what you need to do in today's lab, is to run certain code, not knowing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, and just kind of wait until the program is all done and check out the, the content of the program counter, I think in one of the questions, and then check out the content in one of the four registers in the register bank in another question. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Just in case anyone is curious as to how the assembler works, okay? Now obviously this is way out of the scope of this class. But for people who want to find out exactly how the assembler works, it is all open source. Everything in the assemble tab, they are all equations in Google Sheet. They're not regular spreadsheet, but they're in Google Sheet your equations. And there are some additional code in AppScript. So if you turn on AppScript, you can actually see you know, some of the other stuff that I need to do over here. So the whole thing is open source if you are curious. If you're ever curious about how the assembler itself works, you can actually see that. And if you need some tutoring for this class, Marco in the Mesa Center is probably one of the best tutors for this class. Okay. So if you qualify for Mesa tutoring, um, then I would use that as a resource. Okay, because Marco is very good at this stuff. All right, do we have any questions at this point? Okay. Oh, just one more thing, because you know, I think it is kind of important. Uh, let me go back to the announcements. And going back to post exam one suggestions. So if someone is getting a relatively low score, okay, you know, meaning a D or an F, which is very concerning at this point of this class. Um, there are a few things that I can suggest, but one thing I have not mentioned yet over here that is actually very important is, is to show up in class on time, okay? Because you know, if somebody is missing like the first 20 minutes or half an hour of the lecture, the rest, of the class time can be very difficult to catch up with. Okay, so being on time is actually very important in this class because all the concepts just kind of stack up. So missing the first portion of a class can potentially make the rest of the class really hard to understand. Even though everything is recorded, you know, missing the lecture itself is actually missing a great deal. And then the rest of this module just talks about your know, time budgeting which basically says for every hour you spend in this classroom, okay, let me take it back. For every hour that you're supposed to spend here in the classroom, you're supposed to spend two hours outside of the classroom to study, to review the notes, to you read ahead of time, to experiment, and basically do things to help you understand the material. So you have to budget that time in because if you don't have that time budgeted in, you cannot possibly spend time to do it because it's not in your budget. So these are recommendations of things that you can do if you want to kind of move your grade you know, up a notch. Um, they are not the only things you can do. These are the only things that I had time to write down this morning. So that's about the, the, you know, the general idea of what this is about and why I wrote it. Okay, any other questions? Having a study buddy can be helpful too, okay, because you know, the process of explaining something to another person can be helpful. You know, you might understand you know, a certain concept that you thought you understood already, but you might get a deeper understanding as you explain to somebody else. Okay, so that can be helpful. 
Um, so if you need to talk to me about your grade and what you can do to improve your grade, do not hesitate. I am usually in my office at 7.30, you know, like in what, three hours before the, the start time of this class. Okay, so if you need to stop by and talk to me, you know, that's good. You can also talk to me after the lab time, you know, so after 1.30, I'm usually in my office or at least in the building somewhere until 3 p.m. when I have another class. So talk to me if you, you know, think that might be beneficial. All right, so I think that's all I can say, okay? You know, I can only talk about these things so much until people actually come talk to me. All right, so I am going to give you the next lab right now. So the next lab is, you cannot see it yet, I have to unhide it. So the next lab is called Familiarizing with the TTP, Tax Point Processor Keychain. So let me uncheck it, or check it, so that you can see it. The access code is uppercase TTP ASM, which stands for the Tax Toy Processor Assembler. There we go. And I believe you guys can all start as soon as you want to. It is due today at 1.20 p.m. All right. Yes, go ahead. Yep, yep, it, it gives you all the instructions. Yep. Mm -hmm. So unzip it into a folder, and then get, start logic in load processor 0004. It will ask you where the other two files are, so it help it locate. It. If it doesn't ask you, even better. Okay. Okay, well, it gives me an error. Yeah. Not an error. Okay, so don't take this one. It's not an error. It is asking me where did I find those files. Yeah. If you save it, then it will it will remember. Oh, you don't need those files. <laughs> so you log it in. Open it inside log it in. You want to start log it in first. Okay. Go and go back to your file. Put some things in. Processor 0004. Okay, click OK. And now navigate to where the ARM is. It's right there. So. Hmm? It's right there. Okay, so click uh, select. And then you ask your brother his current record changes. So you get it from here. Hey, now save it. <laughs> now save it. Yeah. yeah, because if you save it now, then you're going to, you know, in the future, when you open this, you will ask his name. Must be the folder here because I'm going to access it. Okay. It is very odd. Where is where's the folder? It's in the uh, document. This is in my memory. This is in my. So is it outside of your documents folder? Yes, it is. It is outside of documents when I'm not on the document. I created it separately. Okay. Well, that's I have saved the report. Up. You, you must have unzipped the file, because otherwise it won't be able to find the number two. Okay, well, you can get the work done without saving it. Yeah. It's just the next time you ask you about where to find those two files. It's a minor inconvenience, but it's, it's good enough. Hmm. I'm debating whether to keep my near glasses Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you. 